Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Gavinsky's Tutorials. Today I'm looking at Synthesizer by Yuri Turov. This is a really nice generative sequencer. Uh, you don't have to use it generatively, you can just draw in your own notes um, and not morph them and so on, but it has some really cool generation capabilities. It's also got a really, really nice built-in synth, and it's just a very, very well-designed app. It's really a joy to work with. So I'm going to do a pretty detailed walkthrough of it today. I'm not going to go through every single feature because some different settings and different menus and things are too boring really to elaborate on. You can check out those things yourself in the manual, but I am going to go into all the main features in detail. If you watch this video in full, you'll have a good idea how to use the app. I've also got five copies of any app by Yuri Turov to give away to subscribers to the channel. So that means you can win a copy of this, or you can win a copy of his other synth, Shum, which is an MPE synth that is really, really nice, or his FX app, Velvet Machine. I did a video on Velvet Machine a while ago, so you can go and watch that if you want in my archive. Go and look in my archives. I've got 100, 100 plus videos at this point already from the past eight months that I've been doing this channel. Anyway, that's one of them. It's in there. That also made my 2020 Best Apps of the Year list. Uh, so you can also check out that video in there if you haven't seen that yet as well. Now all the details of what you need to do to win are in the pinned comment at the top of the YouTube comment section, uh, including the details of when the winners will be announced. So good luck everyone. Let me just ask you as well, by the way, if you're enjoying this channel and you appreciate my work, one way you can help me out is by actually watching some ads, clicking on some links and ads and things like that. These things make a really big difference to whether YouTubers get paid or not when people are actually watching their stuff on YouTube. So thanks a lot for helping me out, everyone. I do really appreciate it. Okay, now let's first start with an example of this. I want to show you, first of all, a couple of things about how we can use this to play other instruments. So here I'm going to start with an example not using its own synth. So first I'm going to start with it going out to an instance of House Mark 1 by Audio Kit, which I also reviewed and was also in my top 20 apps of 2020 list. My video on that. I'm going to show you how in Synthesizer we can very quickly set up generative jams. So you see now I just drew in a few notes there, I just did that by tapping. If I tap on a square, a note will be generated. And what you'll see is that inside this box, the notes are morphing. Any, note, any notes outside this box are not morphing. So basically here we've set up this area as an area within which notes will morph according to certain rules. So some of you might have heard of a thing called Conway's Game of Life. That's one of the things that you can use in here to create these mutations. That might look like it's random, but this is actually not randomized. This is completely rule-based. And there are a few variations on it here. I'll talk a bit more about this later in the video. But here we're actually, here we are using random. So we can choose random here or we can choose to use these lifelike rules. And different types of mutation will be better for different situations. It depends on the effect you're going for. Do you want something more busy, for example, that's going to generate very, very new patterns very quickly? Or do you want something a bit more predictable? So this is a really cool feature of this app. Now, this example here, I'm just sending to Housemark1. Uh, if we look how I do that, I click on this hamburger menu and I make sure that the synthesizer is selected as a source. Another thing to pay attention to is the channel filter. So which channels is this instance of Housemark1 receiving on? So here I've got it receiving on all channels. So it's going to be getting all of the MIDI data that the synthesizer is sending out. But of course, we don't have to set it up like that. So if I go back into Synthesizer and I'm going to go into the built-in song library and I'm going to choose this 
one called mellow chord progression. And if we look in the MIDI tab here, we open this MIDI tab and go down to this output channel mapping. So here, this is containing the information about which octaves in the sequencer are sent out on which channels. And if I click back out then, so we can see here, octave one is going out on channel one, octave two is going out on channel two, and so on. So I'll click back out of this, I'll go back into AUM, and I'll look at some something else that I set up here. So here I have three of these uh, SWOM aud by audio modeling. We've got a tuba, we've got a tenor trombone, we've got a trumpet. Okay. Now, uh, let me turn the audio kit off. So you see here, this is just getting channel one stuff, so it's just getting some of the bassy things from the first octave. This is receiving on only channel two. And this trumpet over here is receiving on only channel three and four. So don't think that you can only use this to play one instrument. You can set it up. You can control as many different instruments as you like with this. So you could use this to come up with very, very sophisticated different songs and things like that. It's really brilliant. But the synth also sounds really fantastic. So we're going to have a listen to the synth in a minute. So first, let me just uh, walk you through some of the main features on the main screen. Now, first thing I want to do in this main window is click on this MIDI tab at the bottom and look at the third parameter here, synthesizer sound engine. So at the moment that is off because just now I was sending the MIDI out and I didn't want us to hear the internal synth. So I'm turning that on and now we're going to start hearing its own synth. The couple of things that I need to do first, I need to press play and secondly, it's only going to start when it comes back to the first step in the sequence. So we go through some of the important things on this first screen. Again, as I said earlier, I'm not going to go through everything, just some things that are important to point out. Uh, you can check the manual for other details yourself. So this record button at the bottom we can use to record the audio from our sessions. This um, BPM, we can use this knob here to adjust the BPM. And if we press fine adjust, then this knob will do smaller little adjustments for more fine-tuned BPM changes. Here we set the number of steps for the sequence. That can be a cool thing to play with live, right? Because you could start with just a very short loop and then build it up to something longer. Of course, another way you could use this is to set a weird number of steps, like five, for example, and then you're gonna get these much more complex rhythmic patterns. But let's put it back to, what was it, 16, right. Um, another thing I want to mention is we have these three little tabs here. So this is the synth tab, and we're going to look at that in a second, so I won't talk about it further right now. Here we have the sequencer tab. This allows us to select a scale and various other things like step lengths and the key and so on and so on. Again, I'll look at this in more detail later in the video. Over here on the right, we have this morph section. So we'll talk about that later. I'll point out here we can change the synth preset. And down, if I'm going to close this, the next one we have velocity. So here we can just drag to adjust the velocity of individual steps, or we can just kind of 
drag across horizontally like that to quickly dial in the velocity we want. We have the MIDI tab here. Some settings here. And here we choose the song that we want. So what's the difference between these song presets and the synth presets? So basically here, if I select different things, what'll happen is the sequence will change and it will load with whatever synth sound was saved with that preset. But if we go in to the sequence window and we choose the synth preset we want, this is not going to have any effect on the sequence. So that's very important to bear in mind. Now, just a couple of small criticisms I'd like to make here. First thing, I find it a bit weird that the button for changing synth presets is in the sequencer window. I understand maybe that was done for purposes of saving space in the in the UI, I don't know, but I would personally prefer if this was in the synth section. Another thing I would like to suggest, Yuri, the developer, please add arrows here so that we can quick, quickly demo different presets. If, if you're a regular on my channel, you'll have noticed that this is a criticism I often make of synths because a lot of developers do not do that. To me, when I, especially when I'm first playing with a new instrument, I really want to just go through and demo the presets one after the other without having to go in, you know, and open up a menu. I choose something, the menu closes. If I want to go to the next one, I need to open it again. I need to go and click on the next one. I find that incredibly tedious. So please, Yuri, add arrows. I would like to see arrows added to this synth preset box and to the scale box. Because again, why do I want to always menu dive? I might want to just quickly browse through and see what different scales sound like just using arrow buttons. Also in this song selector down at the bottom, that would really benefit from arrows. Another thing I want to mention before we move on is this save button at the bottom, right? So we can save our presets that we make ourselves using that. Another thing is this synth sequence and velocity tab, you can have any combination of these open on the screen at any given time. For example, if I click on the synth one, and then I go and click on Velocity, for example, that Velocity tab will open above the Synth tab. And if I now click on Sequence, now the Sequence one will open here. But if I then click again on Velocity, for example, that Velocity tab will disappear, and we'll have the Sequencer tab and the Synth tab only. If I now click on Velocity tab again, that will pop up here and fill this top space. I think this has been really, really well done. Apart from that criticism I just made about those arrows, I think this is an example of an extremely good iOS app interface. I really, really like it. Plus, it just looks beautiful. This is really um, very easy on the eyes. It looks absolutely great to me. So overall, I'm really a fan of the interface, I must say. Okay, so now we'll go and take a look at the synth section. So first I'll get a song going. Okay, let's use this, why not? First I'm gonna just change the velocity a little bit. I'm going to change the BPM. And open the synth window. First thing I'm going to do is get the reverb down a little bit. 
and I'm going to turn off the LFO, which until now was just controlling the filter. I want something a little bit simpler. I'm going to turn off the delay as well. And I'm going to turn off the second oscillator. So if we look here, we have oscillator 1 level. And here we have oscillator 2 level. Okay, let me see, is there anything else that I want to change here? That looks fine. All right. So, we have two oscillators. Let's just play with oscillator one. So we have sine, triangle, saw, and square waves. Now here we have these little things that show what octave the oscillator is operating on. This is based on the way that people talk about pitch in, in organs. I was asking Yuri about this because I was a bit like, why do it in feet? So apparently this came from a thing that people would use to talk about octaves on organs. And it refers to the length of the pipes. All you need to remember is that higher number actually means lower sound. So two is the highest. So obviously one nice thing to do is have one oscillator set, let's say at 8 for example, and set the next one at, at a 4 for example, or a 16 or whatever. Now, then we have the filter. It's a really, really nice sounding filter. I'm not going to name any names, but a couple of days ago I was playing with an app that just has one of the worst filters I've ever heard in my life. And it really, really made me appreciate the quality of the filter in this. I think these are great sounding filters. And then here we have the filter envelope. Just raise the attack a little bit to delay the onset of the filter effect. Okay, now below that, we've got the amp envelope. Now, oscillator 2, interval and detune. So, we can set it at a different interval, maximum one octave up or one octave down. and detune. Now, you'll notice over here in the LFO section, we can set oscillator to detune. That's what this O2 DT thing is. If I bring up the amount of that, That's now modulating that detune amount. And we can have it synced or free. So we can set the LFO target as the filter. Or pitch. We 
getting this tremolo effect. Sorry, vibrato effect. <laughs> With hump, we're getting tremolo. And again, we have four different waveform shapes for the LFO. If I could make one criticism here, I would like to have the option of having more targets. Why only four? It would be nice to be able to put the LFO on anything we want. But I am glad that it has two LFOs, but definitely more targets would be good. Something maybe could be added in a future update, I hope. Let's, uh, let's just jump and listen to a different synth preset. So I'll let you hear a few different presets. some really nice clicky ones like this. I'm not going to go through all of them, but this gives you an idea. By the way, if you like the cut of the jib of this app, <laughs> make sure you watch the video that I did a few weeks ago on Polyphase, which is another similar app. Generative MIDI combined with a beautiful inbuilt synth. Bo both of these are great apps and they're very different in the way they're implemented. They're both really, really well worth getting. Let's go to something... A little bit of a short decay. I'll let you hear the delay. So down in the bottom right. So we have separate delay time for left and right. Separate feedback amounts for left and right. And a filter. for the delays. And these can be synced or free. And then we have here our reverb. With low frequency damp or high frequency damping. These will just control how quickly the low and high frequencies fade away. I think this is a very good sounding reverb. Some synths have, have just terrible inbuilt reverbs. Again, not naming any names. <laughs> this seems really good to me. Not surprising because Yuri also did Velvet Machine, which uh, is kind of, it has cer certain similarities with reverb. Now the pan, this will actually affect the width of the voices, so it'll spread the synth voices out in the stereo field. Let's take a look at the sequencer window. Now, a couple of things to mention. In the settings window, 
Uh, one thing that is very important is the state of Ableton Link. So just now I had Ableton Link on. So the BPM was not changing each time I changed a song. But if I turn that off, then when I change through songs, we'll see the BPM changing. Before we look at the sequencer section, I'm going to let you hear some examples of some of the songs and you'll see some of the kind of patterns that this thing can come up with. So see here, BPM 85.7. Now we're on 125, right? So now the BPM's changing. If I put on Ableton Link, that's not going to happen each time. So if you want to hear what these songs are supposed to sound like, make sure you turn off Ableton Link. Again, I'm really feeling the lack of arrow buttons here to easily scroll through the songs. Love this one. Okay, let's I just go through a few of them. I don't want to go through them all and make the video too long. So if I click on sequence here, first thing, we have a bunch of different scales that we can choose, including some more unusual ones. But what's really cool is that you can easily set up your own custom scales. So to do that, you click on custom add and now you just give your scale a name and what you do here is you set up the intervals so please input the intervals and semitones between the notes of your scale so let's say the first interval is one step okay fine leave that as one let's say next one you want two steps you click on this step button and then here click two so that will be a two semitone interval and so on and so on and then when you're ready you save it so really, really nice, easy to use implementation of custom scales there for people who enjoy those things. I do think that custom scales is something that every app should have. That option should always be there. Now, step length. So here it's gonna be a bar. It's half a bar. and so on. So we can turn on tie notes. So let's say I put these three together. If tie is off, it's going to play those notes separately. If tie's on, it's going to tie them together as one long note. We also have this thing sustain when paused. If I turn this on and then I press pause, you hear that it's actually sustained the last note that was playing and it'll keep it sustained until I press play again. Okay, move. We can move things right or left or up or down. And then we, here we can clear everything. Now remember you can also do that with a three finger tap. Flip so we can flip like a mirror image basically so we can take what is on the left side and mirror it so it appears in reverse on the right side and vice versa so that's what this one will do look look for example at the pattern between these three okay so here we have one and then two steps up we have this one and then two steps over and two steps up we have this one 
where you can see now that pattern is over here in a mirror image of what it was before. Here we can flip on the horizontal axis so everything below the middle will be mirrored above and everything above the middle will be mirrored below. Okay, then we choose our key and the octave, so you can see these numbers changing as I put this up. Now we can do scalar transposition. So now it'll move up in the sequence, we'll start on the second note of the scale instead and all the intervals will be preserved so that it will still fit within the scale that we've chosen. If you look here as I change these, you'll see the note values changing. For example, pay attention to this, this is now C5. If I click here, it has now become D5. So this obviously is something that you can play with in a live performance. I want to show you something important here as well. If we go into the AUM session, now let me turn off that sustain. Okay, stop that. Right. If we go into AUM, uh, let's bring this up and let me go back in here and I'm going to turn off Synthesizer's sound engine. Okay, now, if I go over here, I can attach the keyboard in AUM to Synthesizer. And then, depending on Synthesizer's settings, we can transpose some things Let's see where these are. Okay, here. So in the MIDI panel, note input behavior, we have a choice between key change and scalar transpose. So if I play into this from the AUM keyboard, see how it's transposing but it's going to keep it all within the scale but if I go in here and I choose key change well now it's actually gonna completely change keys when I press the notes on the keyboard here so again this is something that is going to be great for live performance. Okay, so we're getting a bit near the end of the video, everyone. Let me just ask you, if you haven't done it yet, please do give this a thumbs up if you're enjoying it. Thanks a lot. Now, we'll look at the morphing. And remember, this is in the sequencer section over on the right side. So we have morph off, or then we have random, and then we have life. So Let's look at morph off first. That's the standard one where just nothing's going to change every time it plays a sequence It's going to go back to the start and just repeat exactly the same sequence Now with random the next one these three sliders here will be important So this is going to be the chance of random events This is going to be the amount that notes can move if they are randomly selected to move. So this defines a number of squares on the X axis or the Y axis. So let's turn random on. So now you'll see nothing's changing because chance is down at zero. Let's put chance up full. Now we're gonna get full possibilities of randomization. 
The downside is that it's no longer really going to sound like any kind of an identifi identifiable song with any kind of structure anymore. So probably mostly, if you're going to be randomizing the whole area, you're probably going to want smaller chance amounts. Now another thing we can do is we can change the area that is allowing randomization. So if you look here, this is set to all. That means that also actually things um, outside this area can also randomize. So these can also randomize even though we won't hear them. If we choose active, then only things in this area will change. Uh, these things will stay the same. Why would you use this? Well, basically, for example, maybe you're playing a song where you decide for part of the song to only change down to playing a smaller number of steps. And then after you want to expand again, well, maybe when you expand, you're going to want things to have already changed, or maybe you're going to want to expand and things will be the, identical to what they were before you contracted the size of your sequence into a smaller number of steps. Now then we have custom. So if I select custom and then I select this custom area select and then I can go in here and I can draw a box anywhere I like, whatever size I like. And now randomization will be allowed to happen just within this box. So I'm just drawing in a few notes first. So let's put the maximum of these up a little bit and the chance up and now we're going to get more extreme changes in this box. But that area is still quite small so let's expand that area. I'll go select again. Let's just allow those things to stay the same and let everything else randomize. That's a bit more interesting. So that's random. And then we have life. So this comes bundled with three different built-in rules. The most famous of these is Conway's Game of Life. Let me draw in a few notes. So you see now these are morphing, but they're following the rules of Conway's Game of Life. So Conway's Game of Life, this is basically, it's very deep actually. Um, and you can go on the internet if you're interested in this and learn more about how exactly this works. Um, basically, Rule of Life is a system where you decide the chance of events happening so if we imagine this, for example, we have a grid here. We can think about this as a kind of landscape, right? Now, if I have this here, we can call this a cell. And cells can be on, as this one is, or they can be off. So that means we have also possibility of transitions between events. So when a cell goes from off to on, that's called being born. And when it goes from being on to off, that's called dying. If it survives over time if, in terms of synthesizer that means if it goes through a sequence and then it goes back to the beginning and it's still there then that's called surviving right so things can be uh, born and they can survive for a certain amount of time and then they can die and the likelihood of these events will be based on certain things so for example in Conway's rule of life um, there's a rule that a cell can be born if it has three neighbors and only three neighbors so let me press play here and just pay attention to just these three squares so did you see that this fourth cell appeared there so there's nothing random about that that is completely and utterly rule based that is a totally predictable event that will happen exactly the same way every time so in Conway's rule of life a cell will be born if it has three neighbors. 
So what that means is, for example, if I put a square here, then, and I turn it on, right, that means that now when we do another pass, just pay attention to this cell, this cell will definitely not be born. Let's watch that. Again, just paying attention to this one particular cell. Now, you can see now this eventually the cell has been born. That's because there were other changes that took place over here that made it so that this cell was no longer alive. Um, and that meant that now this once again only had three neighbors, so it was born. So um, these kind of patterns will change very, very quickly over time, and it will become very, very hard to keep track of what's happening. But just bear in mind that they are 100% predictable. They are rule-based. So um, the rule is with Conway's Game of Life that it will only be that a cell will only be born if it has exactly three neighbors. And another rule is that it will survive if it has two or three neighbors. So if it has more than three neighbors, it will die. So let's uh, take a look here. Let's look. Let's look at this cell, this bottom one here in the bottom left. And let's see, this cell will disappear next time around because it has one, two, three, four neighbors. Right? See, it disappeared. So um, these other ones, High Life and Live Free or Die, these are similar but based on different conditions. You can go and look up about this on Wikipedia if you're interested. Um, now, if we click on Custom, we can make our own rules. So um, we can type a name for our rule here. I'll just type whatever, it doesn't really matter. Um, birth, let's say I choose one, four, and seven. It means that if any cell has one neighbor or four neighbors or seven neighbors, it if any empty cell has one, four, or seven neighbors, it could be born. It will be born, but any other number of neighbors, it will not be born. And then let's say I put survival let's say three or four. So now a cell will continue to live if it has only three or four neighbors, but any other number of neighbors and it will die. Let's just save that and let's uh, choose it. And let's see how that works. So this one is very conducive to life. Other rules will be less conducive to life. Let's, let's try some of the built-in ones. Let's go to live free or die. a couple of these ones, these custom ones that I did earlier. You can see this one quite conducive to quick explosions in the number of cells. So you can have a lot of fun playing along with this and making evolving sequences using either the randomization feature or the various different life type rules. And you can play with the size of the custom area and so on. So let's just finish off by saying a quick summary here of what I like about this app and any suggestions I would have for improvements. Well, basically, I think it's a fantastic app. Um, I... 100% recommend it. And I think it's only 6 or $7, uh, which is a really great deal. Now, best thing about it, I think, is the synth, actually. That's probably my favorite aspect of this app. It has such a great sounding synth. But I also like um, the way that you can dial in your own scales. You know, it's very easy to make custom scales. It has a lot of different scales involved in 
in including a few different weird things like these messians, different modes. Don't even know what they are, but I mean, I know who Mess messian is. Um, so yeah, it's nice when things come with a few things that are a bit out of the box. Good uh, presets. The the songs are really great as well. Really show you a lot of what the app is capable of. Um, the only things that I don't really like that much are, first of all, it's inter-app audio rather than audio unit. So you can only run one instance at a time. That said, because you can pipe out the MIDI on different channels to different instruments, um, an app like this, it's less necessary that this kind of app is audio unit than, for example, FX apps. Um, so I, I can live with this just being inter-app audio. It's not that big a deal. But it would be good if it was audio unit. And then, as I mentioned earlier in the video, I don't like the fact that the synth presets are contained in the sequencer section. And I don't like the fact that some of these boxes, like the synth preset, the song preset selector, and the scale selector, do not have forwards and backwards arrows to quickly browse through the different presets. But apart from that, I think it's great, great instrument. So thank you very much, Yuri, for giving us this wonderful tool. It's a really nice experience, I think, to work with this great user interface and very well thought out UI. I like the, the different things like three finger tap to clear everything and then another three finger tap to bring everything back. Only problem is sometimes uh, with you know, sometimes multi taps are not all that reliable. Like sometimes it's happened to me that I've tapped and I haven't done it right, so actually maybe two fingers hit first, and then I got unexpected results. But anyway, it's great that it has that, and it's great it has the undo option. Also like the two finger tap to just clear a particular octave, or again, two fingers tap to bring that back. So I really like those things. It's a great instrument. All right, everyone, thanks. I'll see you in the next video. Take it easy.